There's our patch. It was a challenge uh, to come up with a good patch for this mission, but we, we think we did. And now a quick view of our suit-up process. Uh, you saw me there, and there's, there's Cujo, Ken Cockrell. Most of you all know the dog names. <laughs> That's probably underdog. And, <laughs> and there, of course, is Pluto. And last but not least, my payload commander, Dogface. Uh, we were happy to be going flying. As you know, we'd had a few little bumps in the road getting there. But finally walking out to a resounding chorus of woofs at the Kennedy Space Center on the 7th of September. The training team might be pleased to note that this is one event we made on time. <laughs> and <laughs> the main engines uh, starting up and the vehicle twanging forward on the launch pad and uh, five screaming uh, young men heading off to orbit. Sort of young, anyway. <laughs> We had some interesting atmospheric conditions that weren't really evident to us as we were going uphill, but they did create some good flow visualization of the Mach waves on uh, the rough parts of the, the shape of the vehicle around the booster nozzle or the booster cones and, <coughs> and just above the cabin uh, creates some shock waves as we're going through Mach 1 and, and going past the speed of sound. This is kind of a rough part of the ride, uh, very exciting. The boosters let you know for sure that there's a lot of thrust back there. When they separate, the ride smooths out a bunch, uh, but it's only just part way beginning. In fact, uh, there's six and a half more minutes of uh, powered flight to go, and uh, lots more that can happen, uh, as the training team would be glad to share with you, uh, from this point on to orbit. Once we get on orbit, you know, we have a lot of things we had to do, and we had a tremendous number of things to get out and get ready for our flight. Uh, Dave and Cujo were up on the flight deck reconfiguring the, the uh, digital processing system and getting the orbiter ready for orbit operations, and Underdog was downstairs looking for something to eat. <laughs> uh, Jim was reconfiguring, uh, getting things set up. This was the ergometer. Uh, we had a lot of things to get out, put in place, take out of the lockers, and get ready for our orbit operations before the next day when we started our primary payload ops. This is the, uh, our first major payload uh, of, the, of the mission, the Spartan. It's a solar science satellite uh, aimed at studying the solar wind and ultimately its effects on satellite communications and weather on Earth here. Uh, it was a great satellite. It was all uh, autonomous, so all we had to do was unberth it and uh, turn it loose, and then it went off and flew around and did its thing for a couple of days. Um, you'll see a little bit later, it actually shut down a little bit early. As it turns out, we got 95% of the science done, though. And that's out the aft flight deck window um, during the release process. Uh, it did a little pirouette where it rotates uh, clockwise and then counterclockwise to signal that everything is okay. And uh, it was really beautiful to see the thing as we separated from it and to look back down at the Earth and see this little satellite scooting along. Great sight. I might mention that thanks to excellent training, among other things, Underdog did a perfect job of uh, deploying the Spartan. We had a lot of secondary experiments that we did while the Spartan was out. One of them was the uh, commercial generic bioprocessing apparatus. It's a large tube filled with a bunch of small test tubes that have different experiments in them. You turn the crank to activate the, uh, each tube and then later we turn the crank to fix the things that had done their thing in zero G. Then they're all brought back to uh, evaluate the effects of zero-G on all these different experiments. This is a, a mass measurement device that uses a linear acceleration that it times to figure out how much something weighs on orbit. It's uh, kind of like getting the miniature uh, cat shot, so a couple of Navy guys here uh, reliving old times. <laughs> Here's one of our more interesting... <laughs> One of our more interesting experiments, the training team remembers vividly me going around seeking victims for this while we were practicing prior to flight. But it actually is a, a, a way to test blood on, on orbit or any place in a field situation with this portable clinical blood analyzer, nifty little gadget. Um, in, the training for it was actually kind of tricky because uh, there's a lot more to taking blood uh, than one realizes. and we. We're able to do it pretty well on orbit, although some pain was inflicted. <laughs> yeah, this is the Spartan rendezvous. We're returning to pick up 
the spacecraft, and uh, it was, as we mentioned earlier, a perfect deploy. The rendezvous itself wasn't nominal. Let me let uh, Underdog talk about the grapple here. Basically, uh, things went, went uh, real well. Um, it was spinning a little bit, and uh, between the training that we'd had and then the incredibly uh, proficient teamwork amongst the whole crew, we did the fly around and did a, a rate uh, track and capture uh, very successfully, and, and uh, uh, I was real proud to be part of the team on that one. This is the birthing of the Spartan, which went pretty much like we expected, and uh, after that exciting uh, rendezvous and grapple, we were real happy to get that, that Sucker clamped down in the payload bay. <laughs> this is a view back Florida in the background in the uh, Bahama Islands, Andros Island in particular, in the center of the, center of the screen. And just to the lower right of that is the deep dark blue is the tongue of the ocean. Yeah, very spectacular uh, views passing over the Bahamas in Florida. With the Spartan uh, back in the bay, it uh, perfectly blocked our direct viewing of the wake shield, so we had to pull the wake shield up uh, uh, from behind the Spartan, and then uh, it's going to grow some semi. It was planned to grow some semiconductors, so we took it off to one side into the ram in order to clean the very clean side of it, the uh, the wake side, and used the atomic oxygen in low Earth orbit to clean it. Then we moved it over to the other side in order to test out the attitude control system. Uh, after getting through that, uh, Mike running the systems and uh, me running the arm at that point. We brought it up uh, to the overhead deploy position in order to do a gravity gradient deploy, for which one of the awards was given earlier. The, we didn't touch the, the attitude control system on the orbiter for uh, about five hours prior to deploy and then for a few hours after that as well. The arm is now clear of the wake shield. It turns on a two ounce nitrogen gas thruster and it thrusts away from the shuttle in order to maintain that very clean environment which we had set up. Uh, we were able to track it using the, the laser out to about 15,000 feet, and Dogface holds the record for that. This is the Wake Shield Science Center, and we had two computers which uh, we used to uh, command and process the data. Here's a little work on the mid deck uh, Jim Rowing and Mike working with a secondary experiment. Yeah, this was the CMIX experiment, and it was always a great challenge to. Uh, hunt down these uh, test tubes that kept coming loose because the Velcro didn't work well, but uh, the science was really, was really great. One of the things that we worked on was a uh, crystal that could result in a drug that could prevent the spread of breast cancer, and uh, so we were real, real happy to be working on that. We did get to exercise a, a fair amount on this flight, and when you don't have uh, gravity to constrain you, you can ride your bike almost any way you want to. <laughs> Dave is uh, studying a little bit on the mid-deck there, and as we're going to pan around and take a, a quick look at part of the orbiter wide web, this is the mid-deck uh, implementation. That's the, uh, the global positioning satellite, PGSC, on the right, the computer that allowed us to tell where we were quite accurately using the onboard GPS receivers. To the left is the Goddard PGSC, which allowed us to command the Goddard payloads. Now it's time to bring back Wake Shield, uh, more, more realistically to go and get it. This is the view out of the commander's window, uh, the overhead window, window uh, nine. You can see the gun sight appearance of the COAS there and the, the Wake Shield itself out in, the, out in the ether. We could always see it even though we were 30 miles away at times. It, it shone like a bright star. It was very, very visible. And uh, we, because the Spartan rendezvous had been a bit challenging in some parts, particularly the prox ops, were very confident and comfortable, again, due to a lot of good training and simulation and the fact that the flight control team had worked very closely with us setting this up. So the rendezvous and the prox ops went very nominally, um, unlike some of the wake shield uh, science operations. And we got uh, into close proximity. It's really a beautiful satellite. We have, some, we have a gorgeous it's, view coming up here shortly, I think. Yeah, the sun was eclipsed there by the wake shield and has just come out right before sunset. The, the free flight of the wake shield was challenging and, and we gave uh, awards out for that today and we're very uh, proud to, to have that help. It really made a difference in the entire operation of the wake shield from beginning to end. There were challenges uh, at every uh, step of the way. But we're confident with their help that they'll be able to take that information back to the Wake Shield program and help them get a really good uh, flight on their next flight, Wake Shield 3. 
We did grapple the wake shield. Uh, we did another day's worth of experimentation with it, uh, looking at the charging of the wake shield in order to help assess the impact of charging of spacecraft uh, in that uh, environment. Well, of course, while you're on orbit, you have to eat. And we're provided with this uh, galley arrangement here that lets you rehydrate dehydrated food and also warm it up if it needs warming up. And here I am. I must be fixing some food for underdog. And, <laughs> And, uh, I was eating in bed again. <laughs> Mike spends a lot of time contemplating what he's going to do. And uh, this is some cream of mushroom soup. And I think it's really very good, but he took a while to decide that he was actually going to eat it. This is getting ready for the EVA, preparing our helmets with some anti-fog. A lot of equipment that we had to get ready for it. We spent six to eight hours getting all of our equipment and tools ready to go outside. Uh, here we are preparing some of the tools, the rigid tether in my hands. Uh, and Jim Newman had a hope that Mike's shoulder wouldn't get better and he'd get the opportunity to go outside. <laughs> it didn't work out that way. <laughs> if, if there was any chance of him doing it, he just lost it when we shoved him under there because we banged him right into the airlock. <laughs> This is a shot in the airlock with Mike and I almost ready to go outside. We spent about 40 minutes pre-breathing in there. And uh, here, Cujo is closing the door on us, shutting up the hatch and sealing it up before we go out. And here's Mike headed out the door. Now, we didn't know if it even had an automatic closing thermal cover. One of the first things we did was um, remove a debris shield from a task board, and you see that right here. Um, really, all of the, the tasks we did were excellent, and uh, as a sort of a midterm exam of where we're headed for space station, I think we're in really good shape. We were presently surprised by essentially everything that, that we did. Um, there's a shot of me maneuvering the debris shield, and we tied that off on the forward bulkhead. There were two major objectives to the EVA. One was testing tools and procedures for space station. All of those worked extremely well. And the other was the uh, thermal environment for the suit, testing modifications to the suit and seeing if they work. Here I have the rigid tether on with a, a, a PFR attached to the end of a portable foot restraint and a large mass. It was a pretty awkward uh, arrangement that we had to then put behind us to translate down the silt. And here Mike is, he's very stationary. If you look just to his, uh, the left of his elbow, you see the body restraint tether, which is a device used to hold you in place in orbit. And it worked very well, hold, held you very rigid. This is uh, during the thermal eval, and we had the opportunity to spend 45 minutes hanging upside down on the arm. And uh, I can tell you the view was just exceptional. And uh, that's probably the last chance we'll have to actually spend 45 minutes doing nothing but observing. Moving the guys around on the end of the arm was, a, was, a, was kind of fun, actually. If I found if I moved them quick enough, I could shake them loose. <laughs> Which he did a couple of times. <laughs> it was a great view, and uh, the EVA went very well. When we were done, we had to clean up all the mess we'd made out in the payload bay. We had to pack up. Mike was taking off one of the thermal cubes to measure the thermal environment. And the sack I have in my hand has all of our tools. It was a great tool bag, and we carried that back to the airlock for putting everything away. We were out for about six and a half hours and accomplished all the major objectives for the EVA. It went, besides being a great experience, it went very well. And this is the final stages of uh, ingress. Uh, it was uh, a great experience, and um, uh, I think we're in good shape to, to do the station. This is back in the airlock and buttoning things up to come home. <coughs> We had to put everything away after we got back inside, clean up the suits and, uh, for the possibility of having to reuse them again. We weren't so lucky. One of the good things you can do when you have people in space is to look out the window and use your mind to figure out what's a good thing you could take a picture of and what might help geologists, meteorologists, and uh, all kinds of uh, scientists on the ground in their study of the Earth. This is the tip of uh, Somalia and one of the single tombolos that sticks out into the Red Sea. Uh, from a meteorologist, meteorologist point of view, the, uh, our flight had great opportunities to see two large hurricanes. One was Luis and this one here is Maryland. 
Luis was so big you could hardly see it all uh, through one window. It, it covered more, almost more than the horizon. We also had a small problem you may have heard about with our potty. Uh, we had to dump our water into a bag, and this is us getting ready. That's a filter that's attached to a tube that then gets attached to a bag. At this point in the flight, I felt like I had done just about everything you could hope for on your first flight, but no, and we got a chance to <laughs> excel at being space plumbers. <laughs> Underdog found out why plumbers make so much money. <laughs> <laughs> the cabin in Stowe was uh, getting ready to come home. We were pulling all the bags out of the airlock and trying to find places for them. So we were stuffing them into the sleep bunks and, and arranging them to try to get ahead of the timeline. The Diorbid prep timeline is fairly tight. So the day before, we pulled all the uh, bags out and uh, actually buttoned up the airlock. And here's a, a gorgeous shot. Fortunately, we had some great photographers on board. Both uh, Cujo and Dogface are exceptionally good photographers. They captured some, some great scenes. And this one sort of was a nostalgic one for us because we're getting ready to come home. A great experience at an end. We had tried hard to milk the program for another day, but we just couldn't do it. And here's the entry. Uh, this obviously is late in the entry. Uh, Ken had a great view of Houston as we came over it. By now, we're in the range of the long-range optics from the Cape. Um, and this is approaching uh, the hack turn. In fact, it's probably on the hack now. We made a right-hand turn entry uh, to runway 33 at Kennedy Space Center. Uh, kind of a personal triumph. I've been trying to land in my home state ever since my first mission. And uh, the last two have gone to California, so we were glad to get back to, to Florida with this one. The weather was really good. We got great support from the entry team, making sure the weather was good and that all the facilities were good. And finally, returning to light at the Kennedy Space Center. Really, really enjoyed the whole flight and the culmination of it here to land on Florida soil was really nice. There not being any place to land here in Texas. Chute came out. We hardly had to use the brakes because the chute worked really well. We had a little tailwind, so we rolled quite a ways, but we knew we were going to stop, so we took it easy on the brakes and rolled down pretty close to where the convoy was and stopped. At uh, 69 knots, we uh, jettisoned the drag chute, and you do it at a little bit of airspeed so that it pulls cleanly away from the engine bells because this, after all, is a reusable spacecraft. It was the ninth space flight of uh, Endeavor, the 71st space flight of the shuttle program. And the uh, second dog flight. <laughs> and the second dog flight. 